tonight I would like to explore this notion of art. In order to explore it, let me ask you any, associ any association you have about the word art or whatever you think it means, just set it aside. And that will be very helpful for the whole evening. Because what they mean, what they mean by art hasn't a thing to do with what we mean by art. And if we can be guided by that, we'll have a lot of fun. I don't think there is any more central idea in classic thought than the idea of art, because if you can grasp it, then you can see why many people today are recognizing that the uh, Hellenic, the ancient Hellenic tradition, is the wisdom tradition and can compete with other wisdom traditions, watch the word now, as an art. That's the goal. This is where we're going. So, in order to do that, I have made a couple of points here and I thought we could work together by saying first that we can just talk about simple things for a few minutes and we won't even need the word art to talk about them. Now notice, there's a relationship in all of these terms. A shepherd is to his sheep, captain to crew, physicians to patients. That's a relationship. That's a relationship. Pardon me? Captain is a trade, a physician is a trade. You know, everything up there is a trade. Oh, sure. That's something, yeah. And we want to see how far we can push that idea mm -hmm. to move it from trade to profession to an art. Three steps. Okay. We need each one. Now, in order to play, all I have to ask you is, as you consider the way in which a shepherd functions with his sheep, most ideally, what would you say is it that marks his activities? What is it that he's doing with his sheep that gives him the right to be called a shepherd? Like, what does he do with his sheep? Now, that means we're looking for a key relationship. Well, let me offer a couple and you give a couple. Right? I'd say, if he is a shepherd at all, he must be able to guide them. All right. So I would say, one, he guides the sheep. And you would say, not only does he guide them, but... More? Uh, Responsibility. Responsible. Too many letters. I'll shorten it. Care. Right. Now look here. Any other? protects them. Right, right. He's a protector. And by the way, would you not agree, in order to do that, he may use some kinds of assistance. He may use a dog. He may use another shepherd. He may use a variety of things. But his responsibility is to function at least in these ways. Good. And when he does it, would you agree there's some other things he must also know? Right? He should also know and have a knowledge of the sheep. Right. He must have a knowledge of the terrain. Right. He must have a knowledge of the dangers that he has to face. Because if he's going to guide them, he should be able to know something about them. If he's going to take care of them, he should know what's danger and what is not, equally well protection. Sure. He has to be able to, to be able to see which one needs help and which not. So we'll put in that north that we'll put in uh, guide, care, protects, and in some sense we may say he helps, especially those who need help most of all, the young ones, the lambs. By the way, would you agree if a man is a captain of a ship? He too has to have a certain relationship. 
and the relationship he must have if he's a captain of a ship is with his crew. I agree. Uh, what would you say marks a captain of a ship when he functions most ideally? How should he relate to his crew? He has to be a, a captain in order to take care of disputes. Ah, like thank ship. you. Care. Guide. By heavens. And a server. And maybe even protects? Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, are we doing something curious here? <laughs> well, I'll put it in. Uh, yeah. right. He has to know the seas and the dangers of Yeah, the, must know the, the seas. Oh, then he too must have a certain uh, knowledge. knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not of sheep, but of the condition of his of the, of, the, of the also the sea and of the sea and the ship and the ah uh, must he know then that the terrain now would be the, the, the waters the currents and etc meteorological conditions right and he must know the dangers on the high seas must he not so that he too look here not the same but uh, watch the word we're going to introduce not the same but similar. Because would you agree, if the captain of the ship relates to his crew in the same way that the shepherd does to his sheep, he's going to take his crew and guide them up into the mountains and feed them grass and get in a lot of trouble. And we just touched on a subject we might get into later, the relationship between tragedy and comedy. All right, we just touched on it. Now look here. It's not likely, is it? Or would you suspect it might be likely that there is a way in which physicians relate to their patients? Ideally, ideally. Oh, how might they? Oh, care. Guide, right, protect, uh, equally uh, a certain knowledge of uh, craft, yeah. of the body mm -hmm. and his medicines. of his medicines mm -hmm. and know the dangers. Ah, oh, that look again, isn't that curious? Could we ever have guessed that? Huh. Well, if that's the case, I wonder what would happen if we now do something curious, which I'm going to call linking, linking these sets. I'm going to link them. And here's how we're going to link them. All right. We want to see then if we can say, as a shepherd is two, that means it's two, all right, two dots. That'll save me some writing, all right? As a shepherd is to his sheep, so too, I'll represent that with four dots, so too a captain is to his crew. Is that what we discovered? Yes. And we could equally say, could we not, as a shepherd is to sheep, so is a uh, physician or doctor is to his patients? Oh, by the way, do you think we might be able to think yet of another one in here? Yeah, what about the philosopher king? Pardon? The philosopher king. I don't know anything about them yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Could we also put a coach and his athletes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> right. Ah. So we could expand those. 
I see, I see. Now I'd like to take one of them, this set, and see whether we can go into much more, a little more detail about how he functions, because that will open up the possibility of taking whatever we discover in this relationship, see if it's binding on these others. All right. As you can see in this very, very sensitively drawn picture, the great suffering of this individual. Right? Yeah. Ah, and he's rushing for help, so he isn't too bad. He's not on it. But he's nonetheless, would you not agree, will even make him more pathetic. Ah, here it comes. Now, I don't want you to shed a tear, but we'll make him shed a tear. All right, here we go. All right. Would you agree now that this man has a certain knowledge? All right. And it, with that knowledge, he may even consult a book or two. But nonetheless, you'd say he certainly has this knowledge of the human body, as we said before, and these other things. Would you agree then? He sees the same person that we see, literally, we see the same thing he sees. But he, with this knowledge, he understands what he sees, we don't. Ah. On the basis of that understanding, he can then make a diagnosis. Now, a diagnosis in Greek just means through knowledge. So it's through <coughs> his knowledge that he makes this diagnosis. On the basis of that, he can then say, I think we should have a treatment plan set in motion, which might then bring you into a better condition of health. And then he will focus on the fact that we have to have a follow-up to make sure that the things that are recommended reach those kinds of conditions and bring about a better condition than a worse. And then he also has to uh, have a little discussion with this person and talk him about the need for timing. That if you wait too long, de -de -de -de, and therefore the urgency must be stressed. With this information, would you agree, now our poor suffering person now has to make a terrible, a difficult decision. Right? And that is, he has to decide whether or not he will allow himself to enter into this relationship. Because he can only do it voluntarily. He must voluntarily enter this relationship. Now when he does, he changes his name, and so does he. He changes his function, and so does he by this miracle of entering into the voluntary relationship based upon knowledge and understanding. Because if he enters into it, and the physician agrees, voluntarily, they both agree, now he becomes something else. He becomes his ruler. And he becomes the subject. And on the basis of that, he has a right to command the subject to do this and to do that, change his diet, maybe even change his lifestyle, where he's living, how he's living. He has the right to make these commands, only because of this basis. Now, he has a right, of course, to reject that, and if he does, the relationship dissolves. Therefore, he then must then accept the fact that he is his ruler and accepts these commands and enters into the treatment. Would you not agree there are some treatments that are of such a nature that he is going to suffer more than he did before and may endure more pain than he did before? And therefore, we're left with a curious question, why would anyone want to obey such commands? There's only one reason, isn't it? Time. 
unless the physician or the doctor tells him that if you don't follow this, there are certain consequences which will make its effect known to you in the most immediate and terrible way. And faced with that, he has to make a judgment. Will I put up with this treatment, perhaps endure greater pain and suffering, in the hope that, what will I do? Benefit in the end, right? And unless he sees that that is the way in which he may benefit, it is an irrational relationship. I remember the movie King George where he had to, was sick and mm -hmm. the doctor's physician took mm -hmm. over and mm -hmm. had complete command over King George yeah, and he did that's what right. he was told and he came okay. That's right. Now, we can play with this now, okay? Let's use this. Now, would you say that everything we've said up to this point can equally be applied to this relationship? To this relationship? Oh. No, not the crew. Not the crew? When he tells... They have no, once they're off the sea, they have no choice. But, they, but there's also the element of timing again. Yeah. And the benefit is that they can be promoted in due time if they follow these, if they subject themselves to this complete rulership. Might the benefit equally be a safe voyage? Or that too, right. And, and therefore, everyone benefits right. on board ship. Mm -hmm. Now, let's raise a point. Suppose for a moment this patient were to discover, first suspicion, then his suspicions are confirmed, that a good number of the decisions the physician has made is so that he himself can benefit and not the patient. What if the patient, see he changes his name, he becomes a patient, the other becomes the doctor. What if the subject or the patient were to discover that each of the things recommended in this treatment plan do not directly benefit him, but since he has to enter into in a relationship and pay for the services, suppose he were to discover then that all, a good number of the judgments, if not all, were to uh, fatten the doctor's wallet rather than to primarily benefit the patient. If you once discover that or are suspicious of it, what happens in the relationship? It dissolves. It's over. Watch now. And you have a right, you have a right to charge that person with fraud, don't you? That's the basis of natural law. This is the basis of all natural law. Let's take it with the captain and the crew. What's the difference between a pirate and a legitimate captain. They could be twins. They could know exactly the same amount of information about the seas, about the ship, about the crews, about navigation, about the currents, about the meteorological conditions. In everywhere they're the same except one. Who receives the benefit? The crew the captain. If everything he does is to satisfy and, and to then to benefit at the expense of his subjects, then what kind of a community is he creating on board his ship? Tyranny. Mm -hmm. If everything he does is to fatten his own wallet against the expense of the patient, then he is malpracticing because it is accepted that if there is this kind of relationship based upon this assumption that these kinds of functions are higher than any other. Let's see if we can put it again in another way. Suppose I say that we can put here a bank robber right, and his victims as knowledge. He must protect himself. He cares for himself. He makes a diagnosis of the bank, careful, thoughtful, plans a certain approach, a methodology. He follows it carefully. He executes it with great skill. What's, what's, what makes him different from these people? doesn't have an MD. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's good. It's, it's a question of ethics. Robs his victim, doesn't yeah. benefit benefits himself. Only benefits himself, and is the victim made worse or better? Worse. Worse. 
Therefore, it can't fall into this class. Mm -hmm. This is the first mark of what we mean by an art. That's what we mean by an art. That the primary benefit must go to the subject and never to the practitioner. So therefore, you see, if all of these people now, by that I mean this set, including the coach and the athletes, put a dentist and his patients in in the same way, if they are to receive any benefit, it's not a consequence of them studying medicine or ship or running a ship and being a shepherd. It must be because they must learn something in common that has nothing to do with their art, but a skill which they all can share into, and that's the skill in handling business affairs, contracts, how to collect and how to assign fees. Now, this is a skill they all must have. And therefore, the degree to which two physicians are functioning ideally in exactly the same way, one can be far poorer than the other, and yet they may be equal as great physicians. There's one other point, they have to develop confidence that they know what they're doing, that the patient has to have confidence. That they really, uh, they have an aura of like the physician needs a bedside manner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he may though, but then he may be trying to persuade the patient to be his patient, right. and therefore he's not looking out for the good of the patient, but the good of his business, in which case we might be suspicious of his motives. But they say sometimes the patient gets well just because he has confidence in the doctor. He might not. Just give them oh, absolutely. In which case, if the physician found out that a placebo would work, he wouldn't charge him. <laughs> now look here, we got something new now. Here we have something new. For each of these people to function on the highest level, they have to cultivate an ideal. Without that ideal, they can't function on the highest level of their art. Let's see how we can see that, all right? When that sad and tearful patient came in, remember? And now he's somewhat better, all right? All through the process, here's our doctor, and we'll see whether it applies to all of these. During every phase of the treatment, where he has to be careful to follow it up, would you not agree to make sure that the patient is functioning most perfectly with the treatment, he has to have this sense of time. He must have to have some idea that certain things progress at certain rates. He must also have the idea that there's a certain condition for children, for people in teens, etc., etc., and therefore he has to have an idea of health. He must have an ideal of health. And the sharper that ideal is, would you not agree, the more effective his diagnosis will be, because would you not agree a diagnosis is nothing other than a subtraction. It's the ideal minus the condition of the patient or the subject. That difference, right, is the way in which he separates from the ideal, and the physician then must try to bring the subject through stages in the treatment to come closer and closer to that ideal, which is capable through the medicine, medical art. Now, that ideal of health is non-sickness and we'll return to that, or non-illness, we'll return to this idea in a little later. Because he, well, let me just add something to it now. Um, would you agree the doctor wants to make sure that whatever injury and sickness the patient is afflicted with is handled correctly? And by correctly means that it is eliminated 
and to the degree that it's eliminated, to that degree the person can be restored, not necessarily to health, but to non-illness. Now, the treatment may have left him exhausted, he may be weak, but over the particular illness. Therefore, to bring him to this pure idea of healthiness, he has to send him to someone else, and that might be a gymnast, who can then take that condition, since the person is no longer sick or injured, and work with him to develop an ideal condition, which then is sound, perfect health. Ah, let's move on. By the way, would you agree then, the captain has to have an ideal of a perfect journey, has to have a very clear idea of what constitutes, what constitutes a good crew working together. He has to have a good idea of what seaworthiness the particular ship may have, because he has a perfect idea. The better he has, the better it is, of course, of what is a seaworthy ship. Would you agree with that? A shepherd, too, must have an idea of what it is like to bring a group of sheep together up into the high mountains and bring them back so that they are in better shape than he started out with. As a matter of fact, more ideal. Therefore, he must have an ideal. Right? Every one of these people, therefore, must have an ideal or they couldn't really be effective in their diagnosis. Without that, their functioning is minor. Now, let us say these people came together. That's easy for me to draw, of course, because I have this rare skill. Right? And he'll be sitting. And, of course, since they're all knowledgeable, right, they're drinking cappuccino. <laughs> and they all recognize it by heavens, even though they have different knowledges, each one of them they recognize has an art. Each has an art. And so they sit around and they share their views of how they got to that point of being able to, to, to function with an art. And I think this is the way the dialogue must have gone. To master the art, number one, they had to have at their disposal a certain degree of time. Ideally, no end of good time to study whatever it is that's going to be their art. Right? No end of time. Freedom to study, right? the opportunity, taking advantage of sacrificing everything in order to master the art. But whatever it is they're going to study, they're going to first, if, if they approach it right, and if they're guided right, the shepherd is only going to work with people who are really great shepherds. The physician is only going to work with doctors and learn from doctors who themselves have the art and have it in an exemplary way. Therefore, would you not agree they're going to have to try to study with those that are best in their field? Would you agree they're going to have to know, right, they're going to have to know the meaning of what these people say. They must know their verses. They must know exactly what is being said. They must know exactly what's being communicated. They must probe when they don't understand and only leave the particular subject when they feel they've understood it. Right? So therefore, they must not only pursue understanding the, the meaning of the verses, but they have to understand, therefore, what is said through the verses. Then, after that, would you agree then, they should be able to interpret, they should be the interpreter of the mind of their teacher to an audience at any time. They should be able to display what they know in a public scene so that they themselves can be judged of their own competence. Now, let's take a look at then what follows. Do you think they would agree then with this dialogue? If several people were getting together to talk about arithmetic and using arithmetic, is it likely that someone could come along who could judge whether or not one of these people was speaking far better than the others about numbers and understood arithmetic better than the others? Would that be the person who themselves must have the art of arithmetic? Yes. Uh, uh, if these three people are talking about cooking and someone came along, do you think that person, there might be someone who could say who speaks well, not only eloquently, but whether what's being said is good advice about cooking? Would that be someone then who knows something about nutrition? 
because we want to know not only whether what is being said makes sense in terms of cooking, but whether the result benefits those who use it. Would we then have to have an eye on someone who not only knows cooking, but they would also have to know about nutrition? Mm -hmm. Ah, if that's the case then, the person then who has the art should be a competent judge of everyone who is talking and doing things within their art and should be able to pick out easily the better speaker and tell why they're the better speaker and what it is their knowledge depends upon. So look here. Therefore, if they're going to judge, they should be able to show which person is speaking best and which is not and give an opinion about it. Then they should be able to go further than that. Now let's take a look at what this means. Then they should be able to talk about who were the great people in their particular art. They should be able to talk about great physicians, about great captains, about great shepherds. They should be able to talk about them. They should be able to explain all the good work that they've done. If they couldn't do that, we would say they don't have the art because they couldn't be able to see the ideal and the way in which it functions in the particular people who possess the art. Therefore, they have to. Next. Would you, would you say what would be even more interesting would be to find someone who in any one of these is able to talk about the origins of medicine, who discovered it, who were the major figures in the field, who contributed most to it? Well then, do you think that same person then would be able to dis discourse then not only on the origins and the discoverers in their particular art, but with that art, do you think they could go into their own culture and talk about what role their art has played in their culture? Yes. Ah, and talk about its influence on the culture and how it helped shape their culture? And if they couldn't do that, we wouldn't say that they possessed an art, would we? They would have to have that. So we're raising the idea of art now, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we can put that in other words. Now look here. That means, let us say each of these can be said to be different cultures or religious systems or spiritual systems. And at this moment, any one of these words will do. Would you not agree in any one of these cultures or religious systems, there are various subjects within each one of the fields let us take one and there's an example. In the Greek world, Homer is said to be the great spiritual source of divinely inspired scripture, as the Bible is said to be in Christianity, and as the Quran and as the Buddhist sutras are said to be. Is it likely then that if someone who has the art in the way in which we were just describing they should not only be able to talk about how their art has played a role in their culture, but since they have that interest, and that's their primary interest, since that is what it is to have the art, they should be able to see their particular art in different cultures, should they not? And if necessary, talk about it. Since if they have that as their primary interest, would you not agree when anyone is talking about the thing that you love the most, that you have an interest in the subject, and therefore you want to see how it's being discussed? Therefore, would you not agree? Like if law was an art, if you could approach law as an art, wouldn't you agree someone then who has studied law and wants to rise to the level of seeing it as an art, they would then study different cultures in order to see how law is formulated in different societies? And then they should be able to, remember what we said before, pick out those traditions that express it best, worse, and know why it's best and worse? Oh. Therefore, someone who has an art then would be looking for the good wherever they see it in any culture. And with that, would you not agree, they'd be able to take whatever it is they saw good in that, and they'd want to return to that and find that good and develop it for their own art. So would you not agree, a comparative study is a necessary phase of study of anyone who possesses an art? Must be. All right, all right, we're going to push this a couple of more steps now, all right? Now. 
Martin Bernheim was a music critic for the Times. Martin Bernheim. Oh. He's a critic for all the different music and. Uh huh. All right. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Now look here. Ah. Uh, before I turn the page, let me just raise one question now. We do not agree what we're looking at now are cultures and spiritual traditions. We do not agree we're also talking about how each of these arts, using the word now in this pure sense that we've developed, each of these are separate and distinct. The shepherd, right? the captain, the physician, separate. Now, what has guaranteed that each of this, these are separate? What has guaranteed the fact that they remain separate? And what can we attribute that separation of this special knowledge in each of these? To what can we attribute it? Now, in the Greek world, that's easy. And that's why I can turn the page. Now here's a quote. God has granted to each of the arts to be able to know some particular work. That's built into the structure of reality in this spiritual tradition. Why? Because different arts are different because they are knowledge of different things. Each of these has a different knowledge. It's a knowledge of different things. And therefore, what you know by one, you cannot become an authority on the other. Like my physician I had some years ago, he was a physician, but all of his literature in the front room was all about politics. So I used to ask him, which is your art? Because it certainly isn't by the art of being a physician that you happen to think that you're an expert on politics, is it? Or would you have to have a different study? In any case. So, that by which we should be able to know what is said done, right? Look here, by that by which we should be able to, to determine what is said and done well in any field is the art. Anytime we can make that judgment, we say, ah, the man who can make that kind of a judgment possesses the art. Now we have some fun. Here's where we go. And this is, we reach this one point, we'll use everything we've developed up to this point to explore this one question. Can philosophy be an art? What would follow? Here we go. Everything we've said we can now use. Uh-oh, not that. <laughs> not that. Here we are. If the philosopher can be said to have an art, go ahead, then there should be some particular benefit he can bestow upon the student. Would you not agree, going back over what we did? Follow it with me. He should be able to guide, care, protect. It presupposes he has a knowledge of what? Not sheep, he's not a shepherd. Not the terrain. Wisdom. Pardon me? Louder, please. Wisdom. He should have a knowledge of. Okay. Whatever you're going to do, it must follow the analogy. Because all we're doing is, is functioning through an analogy, are we not? To be a limited student out of there, just put like object, so to leave the question open. Because we know that a doctor serves a patient. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure that a philosopher serves a student. Yeah, that's true. Oh, you, it, you can, it's the perfectly good idea. You can do that. All right. okay. Would you agree now? What, notice what we're doing. We're trying to find out what term fits into this. All right? So, would you agree a shepherd is a shepherd only because he has a certain knowledge and derives his title? from nothing else other than the fact that he has that knowledge and can function with his knowledge in that way for the benefit of his sheep. Therefore, whoever gets that title, if the analogy holds, there must be some knowledge 
it allows a certain functioning that will then bring about a benefit. Now, among the ways in which men can be said to benefit, let's see if we can now play on four levels. Here we go. Here is our poor man. Remember? Oh, suffering. Would you agree at this point, he needs the art of medicine? And if successful, his condition then is arrested and perhaps eliminated, but then he goes through the physician's art of medicine to a state of neutrality. That is, he reaches non illness. Remember when we said that? Right. Remember what we said? We said now we want to see whether there's an additional art that's necessary to bring him to full healthiness. Mm -hmm. Not just to rid himself of, of the disease and injuries that afflicted him. Would he then need the services of someone like a gymnast who can then t only, would you agree, he only works with people who have reached this level. Would you agree he would never work with anyone who's ill, injured, and therefore he first wants to make sure that that condition has been reached before he then can take our subject and bring him along. But look here. Suppose our, <laughs> suppose our very fine and noble gymnotist were now to bring the person into uh, more excellent health and he looks very good, might it not be possible that he might say, but sir, you still have certain kinds of problems, emotional problems, it's necessary to send you to someone who can handle that. Would you agree then, this is the side of the body. Is there equally a side of the soul or mind? Now some people object to the use of the word soul, but I want to use it in a very strict way. All right, the strict way in which I'm going to use this word soul tonight means four things. All right? What is it within you? What is it within you that brought you here? Ah, let me ask it another way. Would you agree you couldn't have gotten here if you didn't have a plan? Would you agree you couldn't get here even if you had a plan? unless you could command yourself to do it. Would you agree that even if you had a plan and command yourself to do it, you wouldn't do it unless you thought you had sufficient care for yourself to do it? When these three things are together, we can then act. But wait a minute, what is it within you that does that? For the Greek, that's the word psyche, soul. And this then, this thing then, allows a functioning, allows a functioning, and therefore it allows a certain kind of life to emerge. A way of life. Now, is it likely that there are times when mankind is in conflict with himself and he can't do these things? That he's, in, he's not in harmony with himself, and therefore he needs something else. He needs help. Let's see this idea now of help. Would you agree that none of these things we've been speaking of would come into existence if it were not for one fundamental fact? Take first medicine. That man is not a self-repairing mechanism. He's not a self-repairing mechanism. Left to the wilds, left to nature, he's not going to survive. We are not self-repairing. Therefore, we are in need of the, what are we going to call them? The arts to bring about a certain kind of excellence. So therefore, if a person is in conflict with themselves, would you not agree in our society we might assign that person to a psychologist or a psychotherapist? Right, someone who can then help with that kind of a disorder. Would you agree now, does that person then, when they're then treated, 
using the same model. When they discharge them, have they reached the full excellence of their soul? Or have they just gotten rid of whatever conflict they have? Therefore, they reach non-illness as well. Now, wait a minute. Is there a fourth? When I studied psychology at the university, they only studied sick people, and they never studied healthy people. That's right. That's why. Right. That's because of this reason. No, no. That's because of this reason. And also, they didn't because the soul. That's right. You see, it fits this model. It's a therapy. It's a treatment. It follows this model. That's right. Of course. So therefore, we're asking, hey, is there something like gymnastics for the soul, for what gymnastic does to the body, which brings about its own inner excellence? That's the issue, see? That's where we're going. Is there a fourth? One, two, three. Is there a fourth? Ah, all right, now we can do a little more. All right, now we can push in another step. If philosophy can be said to be an art, what should it be able to do if it fulfills the condition of the fourth missing member? Let's try it. All right, because we don't even have to argue about what word to use. If there is something that can fulfill that, it must be an art. It must seek the benefit of the subject. It must bring about a certain kind of excellence of the soul. What? So, in some sense, it must, I mean, it's got to help the soul plan, command, and care at a higher level than it ordinarily that, can. That's right. It can make a better plan. That's right. It has better command of that's all right. things in its capacity. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Stupid must have some vision of the good, because caring means that. Like, uh -huh. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it has to have a higher vision. It must have a vision that will be comparable to this on this side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As this is to the body, so this must be to the soul. Therefore, would you agree if we could speak ideally now, mm -hmm. then we should be able to take someone then who is damaged in this way, mm -hmm. bring them about to the full excellence of health, or that we can put it in different traditions. Hatha yoga. Mm -hmm. Can we? We talk about hatha yoga. Right? Over here now, all right? Here is someone suffering from these kinds of problems and disorders. What would bring him to this? And what kind of a condition would that be? Well, look here. If there was an art for that, there would have to be a certain kind of knowledge, wouldn't there? a certain kind of knowledge and a certain ideal. So let's put it in here. Here we are. Even though I don't like taking away this great art. So this missing person here, right, he would have to have an art that presupposes a knowledge. He would then have to have an ideal and that ideal, would you not agree, would have to be the highest expression for the existence of man. <laughs> Come on, would that be necessary? This would have to be the highest expression for the physical existence of the body. I agree with that. This would have to be the highest expression of the existence of the soul. Well, there's a lot of uh, pseudo-psychologists that put in a belief system, they would substitute a belief system. For yes, that. they would. And then, then we would have, then have to ask, the, which is where we're going, the role of belief and the role of knowledge. That's right. That's where we're going to go. That's right. That's right. Uh, the, the, but let's get there. All right, okay. They'd have to have the ideal of the perfection. Would you not agree? The perfection or the excellence of the soul. And to have that ideal, it must be a perfect idea of the highest, would you agree, the highest good for man. Nothing short. Well then, if there was this kind of knowledge, and it did presuppose this ideal, 
then this person then could then look at someone and make a diagnosis. The diagnosis would be a way of judging the difference between this ideal and the condition of the subject and the difference between that, the difference between these two, when expressed in words, would be the diagnosis. Would you agree then, if he's functioning as a knowledge, he's functioning through knowledge and understanding, then a training of the soul should then be expected on the basis of the diagnosis through the knowledge. Then there should be a follow-up. Would you not agree and time would play a critical role, what to do, what, when, under certain conditions? And would you not agree that entire thing must be totally for the benefit of the subject? Or it can't be an art. Ah, now, now look what we're going to do. We're going to go back here. Now, for that person then to join that circle of three, they would then say, would they not, that that person who's mastered the art, whatever that art is, they would have to have spent a great deal of time on their study. They would have had to have studied the best in their field. They would have to know what is being said and understand the meaning of what is being said, the verses, and understand it thoroughly. And they then should be able to interpret the mind of these people to an audience. Then they should be able to go around, let's see now if we can go around and push the whole system we've developed. All right? Here we go. I think we'll put out a uh, wanted ad in the penny saver. Wanted someone who can function in the following ways. We'll give you a title later. <laughs> right? We want to hold back the title. All right. In terms of what we did, would you agree, when several people are talking about the subject about which that person has the art, they should be able to decide who speaks well and who does not, and know that when they're speaking well, their advice is sound, and it represents most fully the knowledge that that person, as a judge, possesses. Would you agree? So therefore, one of the primary functions then would be the capacity of being a judge in terms of what the individual possessor of the art has. Mm -hmm. Would you go further, all right? That this person then should be able then to Same thing as before, so he should be able to show when several people are talking about things in his area, he should be able to show which ones have good opinions, which does not, and give an opinion about it. He should be able to explain if any of these people is good, he should be explain all their good work. He should be able to explain it. If he's able to explain all their good work, in terms of his knowledge, in terms of his art, then he should also be able to give a discourse on the origins of this art, who discovered it, as it were, who were the greatest thinkers in that field, and then study it comparatively. All right, then let's do it. Let's put it in here now. Now, you name those kinds of systems that address themselves to the perfection of man. Got some? Hinduism. Hinduism. Buddhism. Scientology. Buddhism. Scientology. <clears throat> Scientology. No, Buddhism won't fit. Because in Buddhism they demand not knowledge but a transformation. Knowledge is not enough in Buddhism. I totally agree, but do they do what they do without any knowledge? I think I know something. <laughs> yeah. Does the Roshi have no knowledge about what he's doing? Yes, I have knowledge. Oh, good for you. But he's not going to give them. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Just Would you agree? Just enough, okay. Would you agree there can be others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, good, good. Now, if there can be others, he can now make a comparative judgment, can he? He now can be engaged in comparative judgments. What should he be able to do? Be able to speak of that all. What's That's the, right, but would you agree they're different? Wow. Would you agree there's different? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. There's a difference in each of them? Right. Take the best part, as you said, take the best part out of all. 
Pardon me? Louder? You should be able to take the best part out of all of them. Mm -hmm. Would it not only, you're quite right, would it not only be the best part of each of the systems, but the best part that also represents this art? So wherever these systems come closest to approaching this art, in each of those systems, let's put it in this way, all right? This shaded area, whatever it is. Now, would you agree since that's his art and what we said before, anyone who possesses the art would naturally have an interest in seeing that art being discussed and expressed in a variety of situations and would profit by their differences to see whether they could spot those differences in the respect to the fact they may contribute to that knowledge that they themselves possess in the art? If that's the case, come on, therefore, they would then want to study these, would they not? And they would be able to identify those where, where, where this information is said best. And wherever it is said best, they would also know where it isn't. And in those respects, they'd pool together the best of all of these. Now I'm going to shift gears for a moment for the next point, all right? Okay, shifting gears. What if we now had our physician and we said to our physician, Sir, you are a physician. It's, oh yes, I'm a physician. Do you have the art? Oh yes, I have the art. Good then, sir. Would you not agree you should be able to go into each culture and take a look at traditional remedies in each culture? Should he not then say, oh yes, I would be interested in doing that. Now, what would he look for? Would he try to now master each of these cultures? Or would he try to look to see what they do best in their traditional medicine? Ah, and he would then examine only that, wouldn't he? All right, good. Let's see, we go one more step now. Pardon? Best or better? Oh, yes. Best or better, certainly. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Now, would he do something, let us assume now, he goes through this and says, I think this one expresses it best. Would he now then simply use that traditional remedy as it is, or would he then try to discover how it fits into his own system? integrated in his own system. Try to bring it into his own system. So then he'd have to bring that, discover if it's best, he'd have to discover two things. One, why it's not in his, mm -hmm. because that would disclose, would it not, on the assumption that he's found something meaningful? Right. That would disclose that there's a weakness in his, mm -hmm. or it would have, had a, it would have been filled. But you might find that one system is better for one patient, but not necessarily good. For You're absolutely patient. right. And therefore, he would have to have a keen eye on what kinds of patients respond to what kinds of treatment better than other patients. That's yes. right. He'd be able then to deal with types of patients to the degree to which they respond to a variety of techniques. That's right. Right. He would have to have that insight as well. Indeed. So then look here then. Then he'd look at this and he'd have to say, why is it that it wasn't in mind? And that would bring him to the question of whether or not his system has a weakness that they never noticed before, and then seek some way to resolve that weakness. Oh, next. We did not agree then. He would then have to bring it in to his own so that it can fit. That's sometimes called, can be integrated in all of the principles which he already has. Now, if he can't do that, then there's something that doesn't fit into his art that's superior to his art. Now he has a big interesting judgment to make. But if he can integrate it into his own, 
so that his own principles then can be utilized to bring it together so then he gets a new insight into it. Would you not agree that would solve the weakness? That doesn't mean, though, he hasn't discovered the reason for the weakness in the first place. He would still have to do that. Ah, now we're over here. What, how do you, how do you uh, place the idea like some modern doctors are in fact admitting that there's much to some of this uh, traditional medicine and they don't know why it works exactly, like acupuncture, they, they have theories, but they don't know why it works, and it doesn't fit into anything they've got yet, and they're going to go ahead and use it. Okay. <laughs> That's a weakness within their system. And they'd have to acknowledge there's a weakness in their system, and they would have to try to discover why, cert why something works, yet doesn't fit into the principles that operate in their system. They'd either have to add to their principles, which would allow that, therefore it would become more comprehensive, but that would mean the part would have to be integrated to fit within it in terms of its principles with the adjunctive principle that they've discovered. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's true, now we go back over here. See, as an example. Would, he, would you agree he would not want to study the whole culture and all their views, but he's only going to go again for the best mm -hmm. and the most developed? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, he would only go for the best and the most developed? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, my dad, yeah, oh yeah, okay, with this chalk, I can add a lot. Would you not agree then, by the same logic then, he's not going to become one of these, but he's going to try to draw those into a more integrated form to strengthen his own position and remove that particular vulnerability or weakness that existed before. Ah, so in that way he can then perfect even further his own system by a comparative study. I want to go one more step with this now. All right. Therefore, if someone is into comparative study of different spiritual systems, because they can tell you stories about each one, and can give very learned accounts of who said what and when they said it, we would say that's a wonderful thing to know. You haven't reached the level of an art until you can go the next step and point out if there's anything in these different cultures or different religious and spiritual systems that is so significant that cannot be included in your own or doesn't have a corresponding piece in your own, because that's the goal of an art, to make the art as perfect as possible. So that, let's say, would you not agree there are various people in our, our society who make comparative studies Oh, you know, Joe Campbell, Alan Watts, a whole group of people. Yeah. But we would say to them, would we not, it's nice to hear these stories. Mm -hmm. It's nice that you've understood these, but we want you to go the next step and identify those pieces that are so profound and their profundity as a measure in this sense of the fact that we don't have it in our own and need it to overcome a weakness and therefore, would you not agree they would not be comparative specialists at all? Only to the degree that they're looking for the goods which are there and may not have a comparable part in their own art. So in other words, they have the information, but they're not, it, they haven't mastered it into knowledge. Uh, of these people. Right. That's right, they don't have arts. Mm -hmm. That's right. If they're not doing something similar, they wouldn't have the art. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's a nice jump. No, that's right. Therefore, if anyone who does take their discipline, this particular spiritual discipline, as an art, mm -hmm. would you not agree, here's the hard step, they would have to make a different kind of synthesis of what it is they have discovered and not merely be content to talk about each one, their strengths and weaknesses. In other words, they'd have to make, be willing to let it have an impact on what they're doing. Pardon? Do it again. Do it again. In other words, say, say a Christian, mm -hmm. say you have an art called Christianity is going to benefit the soul. Mm -hmm. You'd say fine. Then it would behoove a Christian theologian to 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 uh, study all other religions. 
looking yeah. for that which benefits the soul in a certain way. That's right. And to see if any of these other religions may have aspects that haven't been developed in Christian religion. That's right. That's right. Because and then, then you'd have to acknowledge his own position had a weakness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, augmented. And be willing to augment it. Yes. In other words, if the system's not willing to grow and augment, then That's you right. say that it's frozen in time. Frozen in time, therefore, can't be an art. Can't be an art. Therefore, can't really be a benefit. That's right. That's right. Look, now, okay. see that one part. I want to stress that you said. Okay, one part. Because when these, when this is identified as significant and meaningful, that that fulfills a weakness or a gap in the art. The ultimate test would be whether or not then it could be used to benefit the subject. Back to it, isn't it? Because we are after, are we not, the perfection of man, the perfection of the soul. Mm -hmm. And therefore, since that's our goal, we will discover it anywhere we can to bring out those parts which are the best in these systems. And if those best parts in each system happen to be better than the others, we will then want to look at them to see whether or not we have something comparable in our art. If we do not have it, it would be a weakness. We would want to then augment it into our own system. If we could integrate it within the principles that we have, or adjust our system to add to it other principles so that it would be a more full and unified whole for the benefit of man. All right. So the Greeks then end, this is this, by the way, everything I put on this board comes principally out of Plato's Republic, comes out of Plato's Gorgias, with a variation or two, I must admit, out of Plato's Ion, Republic, <coughs> Gorgias, which by the way, on my notes last week, I misspelled, I was told by some colleagues of mine, I do that a lot. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. I don't have the art of spelling. <laughs> that means it's very creative. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sometimes to avoid it, you know, I can I can grasp the very nature of it. Like, uh, has an and has an H. And no e. Which one? Oh yeah. See, see, see. How about this one? Psychology. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough foolery. <laughs> okay. Now, this is what the Greeks add. This is really very beautiful. This comes, of course, out of Plato's Ion. And so, in the Platonic world, God functions in two ways. Of course, he inspires men. He inspires these systems, Homer. He inspires Homer divinely inspired, so that therefore when the poet is divinely inspired, there's no mind left in him, and therefore the God can speak through that poet, and therefore man can then be influenced by the divine inspiration in a variety of ways. There's another function of God in the Platonic universe, and that's this one, that God has granted to each of the arts to be able to know some particular work. Now I can add to it what we both what we most need. For the benefit of man. So that man can become more excellent as a man. And therefore, that mankind can become more excellent in their relationships both within themselves and with others. That's the goal of this curious game. Now, we have, we've still got a problem here. What is it that benefits man among all of these different things? Right? What kind of benefit is way up here on top of them all? Now, each of these systems is going to make a claim for that. And in this respect, there's a great commonality to them all. And that is wisdom, where they are all wisdom traditions. 
but they may describe the experience or the state of mind of wisdom differently. Now, in the Platonic world, let me give you now the Platonic vision. And let's see if we can enter it into what we've been doing. To gain an insight into the nature of ultimate reality, right, which can only occur, of course, with the mind alone, that experience of the nature of ultimate reality, the, right, the experience, the, ex the impact it has on the, on the soul of man, the experience itself, is beauty, an overwhelming experience of beauty. It is experienced as uh, a profound, brilliant radiance. How about ecstasy? Pardon me? Ecstasy. And that effect that has on him, right? Is joy. Now what's curious about that experience and the thing we need to know is why that benefits the man who experiences it. That's all. Two, right? Where's the benefit? And why call it wisdom? Well, in the Platonic vision, it follows that if you have this experience, you recognize simultaneously that there is no difference between <coughs> the mind alone that sees it and what it sees are one and the same. Therefore, it's a. Pardon? Takes one to know one. Takes one to know one. <laughs> That's right. Takes one to know one. So then, would you agree? He's smiling because he realizes that fundamentally, in his most basic nature is no different than this most profound, brilliant radiance, which is nothing other than the mind itself unfolding itself to itself. And if he can see that, he knows he's okay. That is to say, he knows. There is goodness at the very heart of reality. And when you know that you're good and the nature of reality is good, does that benefit you? Yes, it does. That's a benefit. Now, why do they call it wisdom? Now, this is a real curious thesis, and I'm going to share it with you, all right? <clears throat> wisdom is a very curious word all the words connected with wisdom, sabatina, all of those words. It has its root in this. You see, sight is always something there. Hearing is out there. But when you eat a munch on a nice juicy lemon, where is it? You're the lemon. No difference. Therefore, in this experience, no difference. And it's captured in the word wisdom. No difference. It comes from the use of the word taste. Isn't that curious? Isn't that interesting? Is that, is, so it's beauty. So it's, it's really this is an overwhelming experience of beauty. That's, That's interesting right. Because the Hindu aesthetic term, he's term in Hindu aesthetics is rasa. That's a R-A-S-A. -A. That's right. Yeah, That's right. Taste. That's right. Smell. Which is taste. That's yeah. right. Same thing. Yeah. That's right. Comes right out of the same thing. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. When they talk about the Kundalini, they, they mention all these things. That's right. See, one of these things then could be Kundalini Yoga, uh -huh. and therefore this person who has the art would have to see whether or not the addition of elements of Kundalini are necessarily part of this art that we're developing. So Starbucks really right. is the highest. But Kundalini is not limited to yoga. Yeah, Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks is the highest. <laughs> Heavenly dollars. <laughs> the Kundalini is not limited to yogi. To yogi. It's yes. The Kundalini is happening in all cultures. Absolutely. Therefore, 
Would you not agree? This would bring together all of these together into a fine unity, kundalini, of course. Pranayama, of course, right? All of those things into a union. But what's new? Notice, let's go back and take a look at it. The thing that's over and over brought out is that it is intelligible. It can be shown, give opinions about it, explain, and give a discourse. What's a discourse? It's what we're doing together. We're giving a discourse, which means every point we can go over together, you can follow along with it, you can come to the same conclusion as the speaker, and you're not being told, you're brought together in a discourse. Therefore, the whole thing is intelligible. And that's one of the great goals, is to make it intelligible so that you can fully, here we go, understand what's being said, then grasp the meaning behind the words so that then you can see that there's a good being addressed, it's the best in every system, and that becomes, if you can express these ideas to someone else in an audience, you're making the step into a art. Thank you, that's where I wanted to go. <laughs> now we can go, uh, can we? Yeah, I'll take more questions, but I can go somewhere else with it in a few minutes. Oh, tragedy and comedy. Oh, we can do it. Why don't you try? I just kind of like the that myself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to make a point about belief. Some people stop with belief and they're that's satisfied that's with that and they never go beyond. You're absolutely right. That's where we were going. Yeah. That's where, as a matter of fact, that's exactly where I was going. Uh, I have a question. Sure. The one thing that I'm kind of bewildered over is that I understood this concept. I was thinking of many different things besides just spiritual study and doctors oh, yes. and applying oh, yes. it, and it does kind of oh, work, yeah. just like the shepherd and the, yes. the, the captain. That's right. But one thing that wasn't mentioned, and with this sort of mm -hmm. uh, ultimate reality and the beauty mm -hmm. and the radiance mm -hmm. of the mind, then there's there was nothing about then, or even here, of really, uh, and when you had the three mm -hmm. caricatures, you know, mm -hmm. there was nothing about, and you said that they were discussing their own art, there was mm -hmm. nothing about passing that on. Um, you're so right. That's so right. Remember we were looking for the object? Yeah. We were looking right. for the object of yeah. this. If there's a philosopher, must there be an object? Right. Yeah. What do you think that object student. is going to be then? The student. Right. It must then be passed on. Yeah. That's the right. Student becomes a yeah, and, and, and you said and that. And that then, then becomes a transmission. But then, uh, yeah. but then at that point, it, it, I'm assuming then it continues and it goes yes. on and on yes. and on yes. and on. Okay. Yeah. This was called the diadoche in, in Greek, which is, it's a succession like there is in mm -hmm. Buddhism, a, right. a dharma succession. And that went on yeah. for a thousand years until, of course, it was closed down by Justinian. Mm -hmm. At 529 A.D., it was all closed down. No more okay. public exploration philosophy. Semantics, but when I heard you say about this radiance and the mind, and this, and this uh -huh. gentleman said ecstasy, yeah. I thought, well, does it stop there? Oh no, it doesn't yeah. stop here. It, could, it oh, no. couldn't. Oh no, oh no, no. <clears throat> there's a step that goes beyond this. Right. Yeah. And there's, well, I think you're talking about the, the symposium talks about that transmission and the offspring. Mm -hmm. No, no. Oh, we're on now belief and knowledge. Now, each one of these has its sham appearance, necessarily. Each one has a sham, all right? Would you not agree there are people who offer alternatives to medicine? We won't even have to name them. But would you agree there are people who want to give the appearance as if they know how to cure any number of things and they have no knowledge? Absolutely. Right? And there are many of them. Would you agree? Would you agree equally well there are all kinds of people who are going to be uh, offering all kinds of remedies in the same way without any knowledge for these people? Yeah. Would you agree there's even a whole group of people that are willing to help you look good even though you're not? Yeah. 
<laughs> paint your face, cosmetics, fashion, that's right, right, the whole business of fashion, right, right. Now there's a whole group over here too that are going to give the appearance of knowing and they don't have any. That's right. Or, or they're going to confer upon you the appearance of knowing. Yes. Yeah. And these are, in the classic world, we call them sophists. <laughs> so for each, there is its artificial appearance. And therefore, this is the battle between appearance and reality. These always are interested in inculcating in the person belief mm -hmm. to try to convince them that that sham is real and therefore that presupposes it's successful that they have appeared so believable that the person believes them mm -hmm. ah now look here we can use this under the principle that the Greeks were great really great lovers of sport and play that gives us the right to have a slight digression. And let's call it uh, similar to the uh, satyr plays in the Greek world. They had plays, of course, and they were in trilogies. And the people would sit down for three plays in one day. But between the second and the third play, they'd introduce a satyr play, a little fun. And they were often... Uh, a variety of uh, satyr plays always showed some kind of sexuality or humor. And therefore, we're going to look at the relationship between tragedy and comedy. Okay. All right? A little Valentine's Day. A little. <laughs> <laughs> what day is that, by the way? Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> I got to keep that in my head for reasons which you, you, I'm sure you know. Uh, now, look here. If the uh, shepherd is to his sheep as a ruler is to his subjects, all we have to do is focus not on similar relations, but same, and have a lot of fun. Right? And we can introduce a story, and we can have a lot of fun with it. Because if you expand these terms, if you expand these terms, then you can then add a story to it, and that story to it generates a natural allegory. That's how allegories are generated out of analogies. Like, as an example, right? A physician, to function as well as he does, needs a nurse who's going to control certain things. He's going to have to have an office, right? He's going to have to have uh, uh, a certain kind, obviously a certain kind of knowledge, and he's going to have to obviously have patience, right? He must not only medicine, but he must also know the states of mind of his patients. By the way, if someone is a shepherd or a captain of a ship, is it not likely he might use a Something that functions in a similar way to a physician, a shepherd may use a? A sheepdog. Right. And he may not have an office, but he can have a tent as he moves around. He must have a certain kind of knowledge and a certain bunch of things called sheep. Right. A shepherd, therefore, functioning in this way. Now, what we say about one, we can equally say about the other. So let's shift here. Now, if you want to generate a comedy, you go for same, all right? You take the part that is known, and you introduce, it's always particular things you know, and you substitute them in your story of the shepherd and the sheep, and that's how you generate a comedy. Let's see if we can do it. All right? Uh, I know a shepherd, and he was about 80 years old at the time, and the people in the village where he lived wanted to, he was really an old, uh, he was really a, a kind of an entertainer in a way, and so they wanted to do something good for him, so they told him, why don't you take care of the sheep? And so sure enough, he had this dog, and his dog's name 
uh, was Nanny, or sometimes just Nan. And the dog was female, so it was a bitch. And uh, this shepherd then would take his sheep up to the mountains, and whether he they always did something curious. He wanted to get to the high ground up there in the high plateaus, and he wanted to get there first, and he knew there was another shepherd going up another way. Gorby was his name at the time. And he brought along them. They wanted to rush to see where they could get through the pass first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what was interesting about it is uh, our shepherd then decided the thing to do would be to load the sheep, use some of the sheep to carry rocks because he had this specially made sling. And it cost him quite a bit to make the slings. The people in the village had to support him in that effort to make the best kind of slings, you know, because he wanted to get up there as fast as he could. And so, of course, he put them on the black sheep because... Uh, that, that way the prices are better for white, you know, for the white sheep over the black sheep. So he got the black sheep to carry most of the rocks as he drove them up to the mountain passes. And so he planned on then trying to get through that pass first. But the dog, you know, that dog of his, kept barking at night at the stars and kept him awake all night. And that nanny sheep dog, I mean, was really, <laughs> really strange. Uh, Oh, the, the shepherd's name, by the way, is Ron. What's the guy's name? Ron. Yeah. And what am I doing? Who's the, who's the ruler? Ronald Reagan. His wife's name is Nancy. Nancy was said to be interested in astrology, was she not? Right? So I'm now going to get the dog to bark at the stars and the moon, am I not? <laughs> Right? And Gorby is going to look like Gorbachev, am I not? And what am I going to do? I'm going to build a whole story about the shepherd and the sheep. I'm going to draw my particular names from this side. And I'm going to have some fun when Ron finally gets up there and he feeds all his sheep on that lovely grass up there and they all get stoned. <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are you laughing for? Wasn't there somebody in the administration See? Uh, Stockwell, I think. Uh, yeah, Stockwell. Uh, yeah, Stockwell, who uh, there was an allegation and it turned out to be true of Jericho. Yeah, yeah. Just make yeah that's right. Stuff, so. so we can bring him in. <laughs> See? <laughs> we can have him as one of his assistants coming up with a little package. <laughs> right, we can have, and what are we doing? We're expanding these terms, putting in a drama, drawing all of our key references to these people, and that's how you write a comedy. Mm -hmm. How do you fill in, fit in his Alzheimer's now? <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. You know, back to drama. Down now. I did. <laughs> there was some rumor that Ron had that condition for many years. Yeah, yeah. at least and 1984. Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when he visited the Queen of England, you know that story. When no. He, no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He visited the Queen of England, and uh, he was talking about his his days when he was with the. Uh, flying in World War II, because he had a film, whatever, he was a yeah, pilot in World right. War II, he was a pilot. He believed it. He, he believed it, believed it. Right. So real, you know, it's difficult to get into reality. <laughs> now, just to have fun with this, now we want, what, do you think we can bring this into what we're speaking about? Yes, we can, I'll show you how. Now, if you want to stress the difference between comedy and tragedy, all right, then you don't go for same, you go for similar. And you do something else, you see. You work the other way. Now, you want to not go for particulars, you want to go for general. You don't have to know the rule, you don't have to know anything about him. He can be most ideal. And now you can draw your terms the other way. He was a ruler who really wanted to be a shepherd to his flock. See, I'm now borrowing terms, right? He wanted to do his best to guide them, but he had one tragic flaw, which he overlooked. With that blindness caused the great disasters to befall upon him and his people. That was very much, by the way, his father was a shepherd who lost all his sheep, by the way taking them up into the mountains. It was ill timing and he brought them up there and there was early snow and they all died, including his father. And uh, he always had that problem of making bad decisions at winter, 
of the first snow. See what I'm doing? I'm building a parallel to this story. I'm trying to create it. That's how you'd write a tragedy. Now here's the problem. Okay, we'll try this now. The comic figure, would you not agree, there's something curious about him. He doesn't know that he doesn't know. He doesn't know that he doesn't know and acts as if he does know. Mm -hmm. All right? The tragic figure, what do you see in that? He knows, he knows that he knows everything but doesn't know he doesn't know something vital. And he's willing to be true to what he knows and push the implications of his condition while he is most honestly and forthfully interested in uncovering his own ignorance, even if it brings about the ruination of his state. Oedipus, right? He's willing to face any possibility to understand what the problem is in his society. And he finally has to turn it upon himself and see that the weakness that he has is the very cause of the disaster to the state. So therefore, would you agree then, the comic figure in terms of knowing is different than the tragic? Now wait a minute, between them, or is there a third? Now the problem is, where shall we put the third? Because there's another figure who says, I know that I do not know. I know that I do not know. Watch now, I'm going to change it. I know what I do not know. If he knows that I do not know, I know that I do not know. I know what it is I do not know and I never confuse one with the other. He's in possession of knowledge, isn't he? That is to say, in respect to what it is he does not, in respect to what he does know, he can never make a mistake. In respect to what he does know, he can never make a mistake because he knows that he knows it. There's only one kind of knowledge that's like that, that you can never mistake for anything else, and that's that experience we mentioned before about the nature of reality. Because it's your very nature. Therefore, you can't mistake your own nature. And that's the kind of knowledge that you know what it is that you know, and you know that it's different than all other kinds of things. In that respect, that's right. That's right. So I'll push it one more step. See, he knows, what does he know? He knows his own flaws. Yeah, and he knows that I do not know. Now he's going to use this with a capital K. Mm -hmm. I know that I do not know anything that man considers worth knowing. Like the Daily News. <laughs> That's right. Right? I know that I do not know anything that the common man knows and considers as knowledge. For I know what it is to know, and I can never be mistaken about what it is I know. That's the philosopher. Therefore, that kind of knowing, where does it place them? See? So let me give it to you in terms of the ancient problem in Plato's Symposium. So one of the ancient problems, which is fun to bring in today, is where would you put the philosopher? Is he between these two? Because there's something very comic about the philosopher. He doesn't care about what other people think. He's pursuing this goal. He can look ridiculous at times to the common man. Right, therefore he is a comic figure. If they catch him with this kind of superior knowledge and reveals it, he may in fact be doomed, which is what they did to Socrates. They put him to death. So he's a mixture of the tragic comicality of life, yet he's separate and distinct from both. Yeah. And that's the very issue at the end of Plato's Symposium. He gets Agathon and he gets Aristophanes. Aristophanes is the great writer of, of uh, comedies and Agathon just recently won first prize for tragedies and he poses these questions to both of them at the conclusion of the great speech and the great uh, dialogue called Plato's Symposium. So therefore, we can bring that in, in a fun way, and say, therefore, this curious art then, in some way, moves us from being comic, to tragic, to really the real problem of knowing 
and that's the issue of the philosopher or the philosopher king. So, thank you. <laughs> okay. So I could also be known as a fool. Sir. What is um, the philosopher's way of knowing? He knows by virtue of that enlightenment experience what it is to know. And he knows that except for that, there's nothing else he could say that he knows. Is that, is that it? Okay. There's nothing, because anything else you know may rest upon a set of uh, hypotheses, axioms, beliefs. So that would render all the other arts provisional. You in the end, they're provisional. Yeah, in the true sense, there's only one art, yeah. and that's philosophy. Yeah. The other arts still exist in some provision. <laughs> what, what's the, what's the, what does the philosopher give to the other arts? How much, I mean, does a well, philosopher go to a dentist? No, no, so let's say it's the other way. Uh, the, 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 let's try. Um, if we could talk to Adolf Hitler's doctor and say to him, Sir, um, did you do your best to benefit your patient, Adolf? He would say, Well, I was just interested in the body. And we say, Well, then, did you notice there may have been something wrong? Should you, who should you have sent him to? For you only benefited him partially if he didn't exhibit the kind of excellence that is really required when you benefit man. So through this, you're finally going to be left with only one thing. There's only one true benefit for man. But behind that, of course, the irony of that, of course, is that unless you're in good shape and you're not, <laughs> you're not diseased, <laughs> philosophy isn't going to do you much good anyhow. <laughs> so there's the, the fun side to that. <laughs> So ideally, our job is to go through the three, to become as free of disease as we can and injury, to become strong as we can. And this strength in philosophy is the most curious thing. And just to go back to the symposium to show you why it's necessary, in order to endure and penetrate most fully into that experience, you have to be strong. You have to have strength. And Plato puts it very well, he says. It's by giving, uh, it's by contemplating that great ocean of beauty, and in respect to that, see, he's going to give great speeches which in fact then nurture and develop, and he gains strength thereby for this experience. Now he puts it in such a lovely way that I'd like to, uh, like to read it to you. And, uh, I'm going to have to use my memory if I didn't. Huh. Oh, you have one? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's... Um, this is at page uh, 105. Um, Next, he must be led from practice to knowledge, that he may gain, that he may again see the beauty in different kinds of knowledge. And directing his gaze from now on towards beauty as a whole, he may no longer dwell upon one like a servant, content with the beauty of one boy or one human being or one pursuit, so as to be slavish and petty, but he should turn to that great ocean of beauty and in contemplation of it give birth to many beautiful and magnificent speeches and thoughts in the abundance of philosophy. Until being strengthened and, and grown therein, he may catch sight of that one knowledge, that one science of beauty which we are now to describe. Right, so that's what it's for us. That, that, that kind of reflection in the arts is to build someone, that very process of sharing it as a building and strengthening of the soul to endure that experience. Ah, good. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.